Hey guys, it's Tommy. You may know me as the popular DM from the series that you just probably finished, hopefully. If you haven't, please go back and complete the, the, all the sessions, all 27 of them, if you have the time. If you do have the time, I'd really appreciate it. Also, drop a like on every single one of those videos, because we love you, and you love us. Anyway, the reason that I'm here today, or maybe well, whatever day you're listening to this, I don't know, is to clarify some things about the campaign that may have not been really detailed or drawn out or may have been omitted from detail because of forgetfulness or the party going a different direction or whatever. So that's the main reason that I'm doing this. Also because I love my campaigns. I think they're just so fun. And also people tend to enjoy them. At least that's what they say to my face. And I typically believe people. So that's what we're doing. So here I am bearing witness to everything that I have done for the last few months through this campaign. So we're going to go episode by episode. I hope you buckle in. I hope you have the time to listen to me. And if you don't, I'll see you next time you click on this video. So, oh, and please drop a like. Anyway, episode one, the Cave of Wonders. The party woke up not remembering anything about themselves. I'm sure you quite remember back from episode one, because that was a quite a good episode. However, as they proceeded onward and they were recaptured by Arwen, the Dark Elf, and his goons, the party was told that there was a diary inside of that antechamber where they were kept in a cage. The party did not pick up that diary, so I'm going to tell you what they would have found out inside that diary. It included a description of a prior excavation that Arwen had inside of the Cave of Wonders. If the party had read it, they would have known that Arwen has actually done several excavations inside the cave and discovered every time he left the cave, all of the mappings were for naught because the cave actually changes and transforms whenever there is no longer a single mortal soul inside. Now, you might be wondering how that could be if Soren and Minamarco were still sealed inside. Well, they were immortal. Hence, the, the, uh, the cave actually molded around them, not transformed them. So, Arwen and his goons had stayed in there for several weeks. We were complaining about lack of food, but Arwen was less willing to leave the cave yet again and basically waste all of his time mapping what they already knew about the cave. Proceeding onward, we also saw that Arwen solved the puzzle of the genie language, but by mistake, actually accessed the chamber that included youth which was completely pointless for him. The party found him dead inside, which kind of alluded to that Ar Arwen's tried to solve the riddle of the mermaids and failed. But later, the party solved because they were super awesome. Moving on, the Chamber of Foresight that Phobos and Cosmo entered later on, or sorry, earlier than the Chamber of Youth, they were given four different visions. The first vision was that of a person in dark armor climbing up a hill that overlooked all the kingdoms. He had blood on his hands and a broken sword. This was meant to symbolize Soren Markov later in the game that had been freed from the Cave of Wonders, his sarcophagus, and all of his machinations that were keeping him locked in. I had purposefully did not reveal the person's face. This was on purpose because my own plan was to reveal Soren as a threat later, as a surprise, and the party was meant to be introduced to him as a a meek civilian, which they later did in the, in the uh, Guild of Red. The second vision was of Charming and Snow having an argument. The lines that I believe I specifically gave were Charming saying, this is not the woman I married, and Snow saying, you never knew me, you never loved me. This was meant to be confusing, because on the outside looking in, it could just be a quarrel that a loving marriage is having, but they'll get over it. In truth... They did not love each other, as you have found out from episode 13 when Luna was revealed the truth by her mom's dying spirit. They were actually not in love, and they were about to, to break into two different pieces, one fighting against the other. The party did not know this, and I did not clarify that until just now. The third vision was of the rainbow dragon flying across the, flying across the kingdoms. However, this vision became moot. The reason it became moot is because the rainbow dragon could not manifest due to the fact that the party killed Emerald halfway through the game. If they had not killed Emerald and let him fly away, or had not been there when he was flying away, they would not have engaged, and Emerald would have actually helped create the Rainbow Dragon. But since Emerald died, Emery was used as the catalyst instead. It was not a perfect Rainbow Dragon, because they prefer a 
larger dragon host, not a humanoid. But more about that later. The fourth vision that they had was about a white knight turning to the party and saying, once again, dear friend, this person that we now know was Aladdin, that we also now know back in like episode 25, I believe, was turning to Cosmo and saying this outside of the Tower of Origin. But I will admit to you, I did not know when I was going to implement this scene. I just knew that it was going to happen at some point because Aladdin was going to be a constant throughout the story. However, an additional part of that vision was that there was a dragon roaring in the background. I admit that my, the dragon that I had meant for that to be was Violet, because there was a secret little companionship that Violet and Aladdin had. This did not seem to make sense near the end of the campaign, because Violet flew off when her plans for Emery failed. So, in my own mind, when, when Aladdin did say this to, uh, to Cosmo... The dragon that you heard, or they heard roar, was actually the abomination on top of the Tower of Origin. Just to, you know, complete the idea of future. Moving on into the Cave of Wonders, they found the wall that was the Seal of Lycanthropy in the treasure room. After they destroyed it, they saw a small girl in a ghostly form turn to them and thank them. This person, as the party guessed, I believe, was Palma. And the reason she was thanking them was because when they broke the seal of lycanthropy, not only did they allow uh, Soren to be free eventually, but they also allowed werewolves to turn again. You can believe this a good thing or a bad thing, but regardless, Palma definitely appreciated it because she missed her little her little dogs. Sorry, that was a little bit mean. I don't feel any sort of negativity towards werewolves. I apologize for that. But moving on. Into the cage in which Sora Markov was, was in, he was inside of a sarcophagus that I believe I themed after an Egyptian sort of architecture. But, regardless, he was hovering over a white pool of goop. Now, what, something that I did not say, I believe, is that the agent of the world, who later became strongly affiliated with Zilthan, actually created that serum and placed Sora Markov there. He did not have the heart to kill Sora because he saw deep in him that there was a possibility for redemption. Hence why Soren was still alive. He kept him there, basically for later use, to be honest with you. And if Soren ever managed to escape, he would burn forever in the white goop. Because if you remember, Jinx had burnt herself when she touched it. Even further in, they came across an old man inside of a magical bubble. The only way that that old man could escape the bubble is by it being popped from the outside. If the party had done a better cunning check of that room they would notice that there was no signs of food at all, being a strong hint that this person did not need sustenance to survive, further hinting that there was something significant about this man. They did not do so, which was fine, because they eventually found out that this was the King of Worms. This was Mana Marco, one of the main villains of the story, and they needed to pop the bubble in order to get Silver Scale inside. See how I manipulated the circumstances? I'm kind of proud of that. Anyway... The last thing in the Cave of Wonders that they experienced was a larva shade, or a shade larva, however you want to say it. A little secret that I did not reveal to the party up until this point is that that shade was meant to be a main boss. The party was not meant to survive that fight. Or, I should say, they were not meant to win, because they would not have wiped. They would have been knocked to zero. The shade would have escaped through a crack in the wall, and the party would have let it escape. That shade would later meet them in its full shade form and fight them. However, this party being super fantastic and whatever else, beat the shade and they eradicated one of the bigger threats of the game before it even became a bigger threat. There is one little factoid about episode one, a point that Phobos made to Violet at the very end of the campaign. Phobos asked Violet, what did we do when we destroyed the seal of lycanthropy? And Violet's response was something along the lines of, you brought the world back into balance. The real reason that Violet wanted that seal broken was pure revenge. She knew that Soren was actually going to be behind that seal, and the seal would have to have been broken in order to get to him. In other words, she wanted to destroy the seal of lycanthropy, which caused werewolves to not turn anymore, and caused vampirism to be uh, no longer present in the world, just to get to the person who killed her mate. Episode 2, The Protector of Agrabah, actually was quite a direct 
episode. Nothing was really hidden or secret about this one because everything was explained about Aladdin's epit affiliation. Everybody knew where they were going, Arya's statue, etc., etc. The only one tidbit that was left unanswered, possibly throughout the entire game, was the agent of the world asking for assistance from Zilfin and Luna at the time for the Northern Kingdom with genies. Because in his words, Charming needed assistance that were only that was only going to be answered by a genie or a genie ling. However, you later find out that this was a trap that Charming was actually using genie lings in a pur- to, for a purpose that you weren't actually quite clarified on. But I can tell you now, he was experimenting on them to try and create the abomination later on. There you go. However, that begs the question of why didn't the agent of the world know this? It's very plain and simple. He was not aware. In his mind, the Northern Kingdom was suffering for quite a long time, and he believed, in his own mind, that when Charming asked for Genie Ling help, his assumption was that he was asking for help of a magical sense. He was asking for assistance to try and unify his kingdom and make it stronger, make it survive. He was trying to assist with the kingdom's longevity, and he did not realize that the Genie Lings he had sent up north were actually being harmed. Episode 3, Journey Through the Desert, had two points uh, for me to point out. One, when Zilfin and Luna were kidnapped and pulled through the desert on a cart uh, li- or driven by Khajiit, and the rest of the party, Jinxa, Phobos, and Cosmo, were all trying to find them, they got lost or turned around at one point, and they found a different wagon in the desert. I made a point to say that there were several people around this cart that were all dead. And upon further inspection, they found bite marks on their necks. Very simple. However, this was to point out that Soren Markov had escaped, and he was feeding again. Dun dun dun. The additional part for me to point out is Simba said something very peculiar when they met him. Simba said Mana Marco had resurrected him. I want to point out that yes, that is true. However, this happened years ago, long before Mana Marco was sealed away. This happened because Mana Marco, who is immortal, had a plan to retake his kingdoms. Part of that plan was to resurrect some of the strongest leaders and warriors ever to hit this land, meaning that Simba is actually decades old by comparison to actually when he died. But he was resurrected, and while he is resurrected, he is actually immortal. He cannot die again except by the sword or typical battle. He will not ever die of old age. Simba was part of Mana Marco's plan, but Simba being Simba, lawful good, typically, said no to him and renounced him. But I also wanted to point out that Simba lost a bit of himself when he was resurrected, hence why his personality is deviant from the typical Disney story, He's a little bit reckless, sarcastic, and a little bit mean. Episode 4, The Guild of Red. (laughs) The only thing to really mention about this episode is actually the first event that the party came across in the beginning of the episode, which was the Dark Tower. The Dark Tower, the secret behind this tower, is that it was erected in response to the discovery of the Fortress of Palma. The evidence to this is found at the very top of the tower, when Phobos is like, dude, there's like two telescopes up here. And I was like, I know, weird, right? One of them, I said, was pointed directly into the forest. But upon further inspection, if they had run, uh, rolled a cunning check high enough, they would have actually seen the very top of the fortress. The whole purpose of the tower was for a watcher to keep an eye on whether or not the werewolves were coming back or not. Needless to say, that watcher died and became a vampire and, you know died. Episode 5, A Keyblade Chooses. There are two things to mention here. One, Nivix, the Keyblade wielder that Luna eventually received Keyblade from. Nivix, the backstory that I never clarified during the actual episode, but Zilfin quite kindly asked for, but I never gave to him. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry, Zilfin. Anyway, the backstory of Nivix goes that she was a shaman in training of the Dryad people, but they're a bit of a nomadic group, a bit of a nomadic race that like to stick to the forest. On their way north, at one point, they discovered Dreamscape, and Nivix discovered the Guild of Red. She signed herself up, and actually renounced any claim of the Shaman people and the Dryad people, because she wanted to go her own way. Reminiscent of the song, You Can Go Your Own Way. Anyway, 
Nivix never finished her shaman, uh, shamanic training. Therefore, during the battle between the party and Nivix, there was a chaotic summon where she did not even know what she was about to cast. This is evidence of her lack of finishing her training. The second thing to mention is that after the battle, after Luna received her Keyblade and the party went back inside, they discovered that the Guildmaster and Gretel were talking to a man in gray. This man, as some of you may guess, was Soren Markov. The party did not realize who he was, and that was kind of the point. But we see that he is putting in a request for a quest to destroy the werewolves in the Fortress of Palma. This was blatant manipulation for the, for the vampires to get rid of their one true enemy that they actually saw as an enemy. Episode 6, The Face of the Innocent. The big honking thing to talk about here is actually all about the namesake of this episode. We witness Zilthin confront his father and destroy the very being that he's had his entire life by literally taking his corpse and using it for his own purposes. Zilthin was fucked up. Anyway, Zilthin confronts his father. But what would have happened if it didn't happen that way? There was actually a 50-50 chance that the father would not say what I had him say. What I had him say was, you never should have been born. If you remember during that episode, I actually cursed out loud because that was not what I wanted him to say. <laughs> but what would have happened otherwise? He would have told Zilthin, you don't know the full story. And if he had been patient, if he had been calm, if he had tempered his personality just a little bit, the father would have told him the truth, which was Zilthin was abandoned by him. Zilthin was born via genie magic. The mother died. The father came across the scene and renounced Zilthin as his son. He abandoned Zilthin. Afterwards, a priest of Avo came across this scene, took Zilthin to the church, and raised him as best he could for about half a year. When this priest perished, the father, Zilthin's actual father, who was a changeling, took on the visage of a priest of Avo and raised him himself. The shame of what he had done when Zilthin was first born, he couldn't forgive himself. And so he raised him as best he could in secret in the background. And so his confession would have been, I have been with you almost all of your life. And I regret what I did in the beginning. I regret what I have done to you. I will do anything to help you out of your condition. Just let me live. Episode 7, The Fortress of Palma. The episode in which I regretfully forgot the Harry Potter thing at the very end. I'm dumb sometimes. Okay, so the party is inside of the Fortress of Palma, and they come across a bit of a secret that I actually blatantly put as a secret. And because Jenny, sorry, <laughs> Cosmo, was born under the sign that allowed her to see through solid walls, she saw this secret. It was behind the bust of Palma. And inside of this little room, there were three structures that I imagined similar to an abacus. Three of them. One, gl one glowing green, one red, one blue. The secret behind this that the party did not discover was that if they had done a simple melee strike on any one of these, the corresponding crystal of that color further on in the, in the temple or the dungeon or whatever would have been destroyed. The party regretfully put their fingers and touched the magical energy of these abaci or abacuses and nothing happened. So unfortunately they did not discover the secret well, they kind of half did, whatever. But as a result, the crystals would have been destroyed. Therefore, the little mini bosses along the way would have been quite a bit easier. On top of the fact that the ritual that they walked in on at the very end of this dungeon, which was resurrecting the Great Wolf, never would have happened because the crystals were actually focus crystals and those needed to manifest in order for the ritual to be finished. The second thing to mention if the party had managed to fight and defeat the Great Wolf at the very end of the dungeon, the story would have progressed as Red Riding Hood actually befriending the party. She would have seen this as a true mark of allegiance and loyalty, and you and I are not so different, are we? And so would they have even gone through Red's dungeon? Would they have seen her as a friend? Would they have been like chums, like Aladdin? or Simba, etc. 
etc. Episode 8, Showdown at Dreamscape Castle. There is not much to say except for one one simple little thing. Um, that being, they broke my story. The fact is that Rumpelstiltskin was not meant to die in that scene, but he did. The fact is, is that my story, my original idea of the story, was that there was going to be a triad of darkness. That, that triad was actually going to be Manamarco at the top, Soren on the left, and Rumpel on the right. Therefore, Manamarco would actually be the main villain. But things change. Stories adapt. And the beautiful thing about D&D, V&D, sorry, is that stories adapt because it's a living organism filled with characters and machinations of dice and time and availability and schedules and... Wait, this sounds like a job. Episode 9, there's not really a whole lot to say, so we're going to skip to episode 10, which was Undisclosed Desires. Two things to say. One, we are privy to Phobos turning down the offer of Ophelia. Now, what would have happened if he had not done that? If he had actually murdered the Huntsman and used his blood as an offering to Ophelia? Well, essentially, Red Riding Hood would not be as powerful. Because what would have happened is Ophelia would have offered great power to Phobos over control of lesser minds and greater strength in war and quite possibly the power over elemental, elemental magic because Ophelia was a goddess of elements as well. But, you know, sorry Phobos, you didn't get that power, so suck it. The second thing to say is that I never really covered when Zilthan became the Dark One. It was actually in this episode. If you remember, the mysterious stranger, who was actually Null, spoilers, Null gave an assignment to every member of the party except for Phobos and said, hey, go, uh, oh, sorry, go and uh, bring this here and bring that there, that kind of thing. After doing such things, I never actually covered what Zilthan had done. It was actually at this moment that Zilthan had a private conversation with me, a.k.a. Noel, and agreed to become the Dark One. Episodes 11, 12, and 13 are actually, in my mind, all connected very nicely together. It's, it starts with the journey onto the Enchanted Kingdom and ends with their eventual departure. Mostly the finality and discovery of why Snow White did what she did. So I'm actually going to combine them all into one group. First thing to point out, <laughs> as Jeff so kindly commented on during this session, that several times I mentioned the paved road from the village leading up to the cave where the orange dragons were laying. The reason for this, that I didn't actually get a request to find out why, was that the village actually was very aware of the dragons being above them, and they actually loved that. It was a decently kept secret, except for the fact that, you know, they had a fucking paved path up to them. But the village had very, very little traffic, and so they were actually hoping the dragons would stay because of good fortune, because of the company. However you wish to say it, they enjoyed their presence. Next thing to point out is that when they actually got to the Enchanted Kingdom, to the archways, in which I said each party member had to sacrifice part of their own inventory to enter the Enchanted Kingdom, this was, Katie, I'm looking at you, this was the moment that I heard her get rid of Aladdin's lamp that did possess the ability to summon him. Just wanted to put that on the record right there. Have it right there. Just, it happened at that moment. I love my players. Anyway, moving on. When you actually enter the Enchanted Kingdom, you see the party come across some guards that were French, because I thought that was hilarious. They kill some guards. They enter the gates. There was a toll that they didn't have to pay. They could have fought, but that would have caused quite a bit of a ruckus and quite a pain. So they actually dealt with it quite nicely. Phobos took them to his old Thieves Guild area. When they entered that area, they found everybody dead. It is because they had just come across a battle that had just recently ended, not even a day and a half ago. After this, Cosmo was given a choice by her god or father, as you actually know. That choice concerned either going into the castle through the dungeons, through secret access, or going back up to the streets. The party, as you know, dear listener, they entered through the castle. 
But what would have happened if they had gone up to the streets? Well, they would have actually participated in the war of the Khajiits taking down the Enchanted Kingdom, because they were actually right on the party's heels, and they didn't know it. So what actually would have happened is that they would have, the party would not have engaged in the dungeon part of the castle. They would have engaged in a war, battle after battle, wave after wave. It would have been a little arduous. However, the rewards were quite high. Too little too late, the party entered the dungeons. They fought Mana Marco. They freed some slaves slash genielings that they found in the dungeons that actually betrayed them later. So sad. And Zilthin re-met with the agent of the world, destroyed him, and became a Keyblade wielder. That jerk. Eventually, they fought Manamarco and his thrall, Genielings. They destroyed the Genielings, and Manamarco fled. The dungeon, there's not a whole lot to say, except for some tidbits about the fact that Luna rediscovered bits of herself along the way, including her old bedroom, some loot that she found in her bedroom, a painting that she had long since forgotten existed, and she saw touches of nostalgia along with negative memories. But my whole purpose of this dungeon was to actually allow Katie, as a player, to choose how Luna would react. And I think that she did a great job. As we get to the boss fight with Mana Marco that lasted an entire session, and I apologize for the length of that session, but I think it was fantastic, that fight was meant to be difficult. It was going to house the remaining dwarves, Mana Marco himself, and as I said earlier, Mana Marco was actually meant to be the main villain of this game. So he was quite high leveled, but he was a little bit less powerful than I would have had him be if he was the end end boss. But regardless, at the end of this 13th episode, the party learns that Snow White did what she did because she wanted to get her kingdom back. And also she wanted to be a mother. If you want the finer details, please resort back to the end of episode 13. But the main thing I want to answer because I believe that Luna was questioning this too, what happened after Luna ran away? What happened after is that there was already a rift between the married couple, and Noah was already kind of this proud, prized child because he was charming son. And Snow sort of lost her mind. She felt like she had failed as a mother. Her husband did not love her. Her son was not her son. And so she resorted to sifting through the castle, going through things that she didn't see before. And that resulted in her actually finding the very same mirror that her own stepmother became obsessed with. But even more so, since Snow White was depressed and anxious and unhappy, she actually sank so far into the curse of the mirror, which was actually the house of Mana Marco's spirit, she could not remove herself from it. And so as she gave orders and became a queen, and actually talked to people, she was constantly referring back to the mirror, almost like an advisor. So what happened after Luna left is that Snow lost who she was. And as a result, she actually sent out her dwarves, her friends, and her secret service, quite frankly, to hunt her daughter down. The big question is, and even I kind of wondered this at some points, was Snow trying to find her daughter to bring her home to safety? Was she trying to bring her home to try and free Snow White herself? Or was she trying to find Luna to kill her? It kind of depends on your perspective. It depends on where in the game this happened. But it's all up for debate. Episode 14, named Dragons Everywhere. The only thing to really say about this one is actually pertaining to the name of the episode. Dragons being everywhere. The reason that this occurred was because in the beginning of this episode, Violet and Emery had an interaction in which Violet was saying, oh my god, you're like malleable. And she breathed upon Emery's scales and he started to have flecks of purple. Do you remember this? Do you remember this? I remember it. Anyway, she discovered that he was malleable and Try to bear with me here, because the party might have had their own thoughts about Violet, and maybe her being a little bit of a dragon bitch. But the honest truth is that Violet was chaotic good. Her main goal was to try to, one, yes, avenge her lover, Silver, but also to reunite the dragons into the Rainbow Dragon. And without Silver, without Onyx, and without Emeralds, that was going to be very challenging to do. So she wanted to find some sort of catalyst, some sort of alternative 
and she found it in Emery. And so, later on, when, she, when the party heard her roar through the Enchanted Kingdom, she was actually roaring to the other dragons throughout the land, causing them to stir, because she was not quite their queen, but very high standing in their little coven of dragons. So when she roared, and the party heard it, they're like, what's going on? As the party ventured to Dreamscape, they saw the orange dragons fly off, and they saw Emerald fly off, which engaged into a battle, which allowed Emery to murder his father. Episode 15, What Could Have Been, is arguably my favorite episode of the entire series. But there are two things that I want to point out here. One, I created a character that Phobos hated, and that was very, very fun. No, it was a bit of a prick, right? I mean... That was kind of what I was going for. Little prince, a little bit of a jerk, always got what he wanted, always had like the, the Bieber cut of like flopping his hair around going, oh, you don't understand me. I'm a priest. Uh. But Noah, actually, his main core motivation was, in fact, to save his sister. So despite the fact that he may have been a little dick, he also was trying to be lawful good. When the party comes across Noah and he runs off and Phobos discovers this little strip of cloth left behind by him because he didn't disappear quite perfectly, I told them that the strip of cloth changes from black to white depending on how they move it in the air. This didn't really quite come up later on and I was kind of hoping for it to, but what I wanted to make out of that was that the robes that the Archons of Tomias wear transmute into different colors depending on what they need them to be. Black if they need to be stealthy and incognito. White if they need to make an impression because they're priests. Red, blue, green. Regardless of whatever reason, they can change the color of the robe. That's what I was trying to go for. Didn't really pan out. Who cares? The game's done. Get over it, Tommy. I'm over it. All right. The second thing I wanted to point out is, could you believe that ending? Good job, Katie. Really proud of you. Really proud of you. But that ending, I will say with 100% honesty and confidence. I did not plan for any of that, and it was fantastic. Noah was not meant to die in that scene, and you know what? He didn't, because Katie saved him. <laughs> so I loved it, every bit of it. The time travel was never meant to be a mechanic. However, one thing that I forgot to mention afterwards that I did actually say to the players off, sc off screen or off camera or whatever you want to say is that after that moment where Hickory blessed them with time travel, Hickory actually shut them out. He forbade any sort of further blessings from him to Luna or Cosmo or Phobos or Zelthin or Jinxa. He shut them out entirely. And the reason for this is because Hickory, his blessings, as he said back in episode whatever, that his blessings are so thorough and penetrating and powerful that if he actually blesses you, it rewrites everything and you are the only one aware of the change. Meaning you essentially only receive one blessing, and then you're done. So Luna received the blessing, and then she was done. And she had to make do with what she had. Additionally, the Guildmaster had visited the party at a hotel, asking them, why didn't you come home last night? And they discussed with the Guildmaster why they hated the Guild of Red suddenly. They discussed why and their motivations. And the Guildmaster was like, do you have proof? And they're like, no. And he's like, well, you need proof. And they're like, well, then we'll get some. He's like, I don't like your plan. And they're like, then you can come with us. All right, now you're up to par. At that scene, but right before they were leaving Dreamscape, I told them that they were waiting around as if for somebody to come see them and to come with them to the Enchanted Forest. Do you remember that? No, it doesn't matter. But I remember that part. And they were actually waiting for the guild master or some sort of guild master lackey to come with them. Nobody showed up. In reality, as you later find out in episode 17, I believe, Nivix was actually going to follow them. And she did, very well, out of sight. And therefore, out of mind. Nivix followed them to the Enchanted Forest to Bell's Castle, and into Red Riding Hood's clutches. And there she was reconverted into Red Riding Hood's little dark influence -y thing. She was essentially a Sith Lord. And she got a new Keyblade, and she fought Luna. But, yeah, they were followed. So apparently, their cunning wasn't as high as they thought. Or maybe I was just being mean. Plot devices? What are those? 
Episode 16, The Lifeless Woods. Luna was given a second chance, and this time, instead of going with her party outside of Dreamscape to wander to the Enchanted Forest, she stayed behind to talk to her brother one-on-one. -on -one. And this time, she was very diplomatic in the quiets of... In the quiets? That's not even a sentence or a word. What the fuck am I talking about? In the quietness of the alleyways of Dreamscape, she meets Noah, and she says to him, No, you must stay here. You must talk to me. And he's like, Fuck, fine. And they talk. But at the end of this conversation, after effectively saving Noah's life from Zilfin, that jerk, she is given the blessing of Thumbelina's tiara. I pointed out to the party that Thumbelina's tiara's gift was to resurrect the person who was wearing it. But I also asked them, do you see why that's a weird item? And they pointed out Noah died in the previous timeline, and he was previously owning Thumbelina's tiara. So why didn't it work for him? Okay, so the answer is actually very, 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 very simple and maybe feeble, but it's my game, so get over it. The reason is that he was not wearing the ring. It was in his fucking pocket. The reason it was in his fucking pocket is because it was not meant for him. Like I said before in the previous episode, he wanted to save his sister. The ring was always meant to be hers. He was keeping it in his pocket, away from his own body, to give to her. When they had a private moment together, whenever he felt like he wanted to give it to her, whatever. But it was always on him. It was always meant for her. The Lifeless Forest, the Enchanted Forest, but the reason it's called Lifeless in the title of this episode is because the party sees no evidence of animals when they actually enter the forest and before they see the secret village. Red Riding Hood wiped the forest clean. And this is because of her murderous side and because she's so despicable and she's bloodthirsty, yada, yada, yada. But it's also a bit of foreshadowing because Red Riding Hood was about to reach her breaking point of patience. She was about to drop the ruse of Belle and she was about to start hunting people again. She was trying, as Belle, to assume a normal life. But she failed, or was about to fail, if the party had not gone there at the time that they did. Now, I do want to apologize, because here's a bit of honesty for you. The beast, or the prince, that Phobos ended up murdering in the library. Good job, Phobos. I named him Rasputin. You might wonder why. Here's the honest reason. I completely forgot the beast's name, and I wanted to come up with an ostentatious, ridiculous name. For all those listeners who's, who are named Rasputin, I apologize to make fun of your name. It is not personal. I just think the name is funny. Last thing to say is that if the party had gone to the Enchanted Kingdom, or to, sorry, to the Enchanted Forest earlier in the game, if that had been their destination, if they were really wanting to meet Belle or explore or whatever, they actually would have come across the original Belle, and they would have come across the original Beast, as opposed to Red Riding Hood pretending to be Belle. So they actually stood a chance to save Belle from the torture that she went through and to save Beast from being murdered. Too little too late. Everything worked out, except for Beast. Poor guy. But he's fake. We move on. Episode 17, The Hunt Begins. They, the party, that is they, they, the party, the party of five, find themselves locked in the dungeon of Red Riding Hood. <sighs> Two things to say. When they first started the dungeon, they went through a room that had three different directions to go. They ended up going down the right path that led to the salamander. But the left path, I told them, was locked on the other side of the door. But it was possible to break through. To break through. They could not use their keyblade, but they could have tried to kick it in, use magic. They essentially could have destroyed the door. It was not attempted. I'm not hurt. My feelings are solid. I'm not hurt. It's fine. But if they had gone down that direction, <clears throat> they would have found two sets of traps, including saw blades. Ew. And they also would have found a chest, rewarding them for their ingenuitive thinking that would have contained loot. Perhaps an exotic item. Too little too late, they didn't get it, whatever. But if they had tried to go up the blood chute for whatever reason, which was straight on, they would have had to endure four, four 
dex checks that would have either required crits or near crit potential. So it was essentially impossible to escape the dungeon. You had to go through it. But the second thing is that a little further on in the episode, a little further on in the um, in the dungeon, they encountered a spider cave. Trevor, I'm very sorry. You're arachnophobic. I kind of used that to my advantage. And Zilthan found himself damaged from behind. But I never told him why. The assumption could have been that it was a spider. But the spiders, in my mind, were about the size of coins or like half the size of a hand, not very large and not enough to really cause physical damage. But the truth is, is the thing that harmed Zilthan from behind was Red Riding Hood herself. She was appearing behind them, slicing and then disappearing. I wanted to make them feel like no matter where they were, they were vulnerable. And this was my first attempt to make them feel like they did not have a handle on things. So Red Riding Hood had secret panels and secret doors and trap doors and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to actually keep track of where they were. Hence why when she communicated to them through the horns in the ceilings, it was almost like she knew exactly where they were and she was taunting them the whole way. Episode 18, the continuation of Red Riding Hood's dungeon. I fully admit the Chimera fight was stupid because it was easy. Not stupid because it was dramatic. It was dramatic and I love drama. But that fight was over in two or three turns. It was meant to be at least five or six turns. I seem to have forgotten how much damage the party was doing at that point. But oh well, they fought a Chimera. Congratulations. Later on, we find the party segmented into different groups. No secrets are revealed or are meant to be revealed for Zilthan. He made a deal oh, and he ran away like a pansy. Not quite. He came back. But Luna and Jinxa were with the Myrrh. No secrets there. They found a death trap. They unlocked the lock. They saved the Myrrh. Congratulations. But Cosmo, Phobos, I must apologize to you now. I put you into a very Saw-like situation with the gun. I admit also this scene was inspired by the, by the video game Until Dawn. And um, here's the truth of the matter. One, Cosmo, you were meant to shoot the wolf. Or your friend. But mostly the wolf. The whole point of the trap that Red had designed was to corrupt the Priest of Bolas. Meant to corrupt your own sense of yourself. How far were you willing to go to save a life? A life that you know versus a life of an innocent. I'm sorry. However, if you had refused, which you did, refused to fire the gun, was there a way that I had designed to get Phobos free and to let you out? Because how you found it was, I believe you found a door out of there. You used mental prowess. You essentially found a way to leave your chamber. My own way of getting out of that situation was to use your mental prowess to break the gun off and use the gun as a tool, a fire it maybe, and the door would open upon the cue of the gun firing. That's how the gun would open. That's how the door would open. I'm sorry if the, if the puzzle was frustrating, but I really wanted to see what you would do, and you did fantastic. Episode 19, Visions of the Future. About 80 or 90% of this episode was spent fighting Red Riding Hood, so I'm going to skip all of that and go right to the end, where Phobos, Luna, and Cosmo came across a secret room in which Red Riding Hood had been keeping notes on the party. As part of these notes, there were listed attributes and details, but also relationships between the party members and others, including a little note that hinted, or maybe even said bluntly, that Zilfin and Luna were siblings, half-siblings, because they were born from the same genie, the white genie that you guys meet at the very, very, very end of the game. Additionally, Cosmo had a capital D underneath her name, his name, I can't remember, it's been so long, but that D was meant to signify daughter, daughter to Bolas, which she eventually finds out after she leaves the cave about 10 minutes later, but that was kind of a, an insinuation that Red Riding could have guessed that relationship prior. Episodes 20 all the way through 24 
are very straightforward episodes. They include battles with Chernabog, battles with Captain America, as well as dropping off Emery, rediscovering Emery, curing Sora Markov, the college, Pinocchio, all of that shit. They are very straightforward. I don't believe there's any secrets left, but if you have any questions about them, please drop a comment and I will answer as quickly as possible. Episode 25, It's a Trap, begins with a party discovering that they only have one destination left, and that is the Tower of Origin. They go to the Tower of Origin, and they enter to find that they're in a place very ancient. Except you guys know by now that our dear friend Dallas actually designed this dungeon. It was not me. And so let me elaborate on one little tidbit that was not elaborated on before. The very, very first floor of the Tower of Origin was blank. There was nothing in there. No traps, no nothing. My job that I was given by Dallas was to set a timer. The moment that they entered the dungeon, I was meant to set a timer, and I did so. Every 30 seconds that the party stayed in the first floor... The second floor would have statues multiplying by two every 30 seconds that they would have to fight. The party only stayed there for 41 seconds, meaning the two statues up there became four, and that was it. So, we're talking... 4, 8, 16, 32... We're talking possibility of 64 different statues that could have been in there if the party had lollygagged too long. I kind of wonder how long that battle would have been. Let's not think about that. It's scary. Episodes 26 and 27 consisted of the two final fights with King Charming and the Abomination. Dallas, thank you so much for being the villain of my story. You kept the secret very, very well without even playing the game. And you designed the Abomination and your character. And you almost got them, sort of. Not quite. Halfway, maybe. I don't know. But you did great. Loved it. He, Dallas, I mean, asked of me to have one little secret tidbit as part of the character. One little perhaps that could have happened to make the fight harder. And it actually almost happened. Charming had the possibility of obtaining his daughter's Keyblade. And he almost did so by wiping her off the field. And the only reason she did not wipe was because she had Thumbelina's tiara, which Dallas did not know about which Charming did not know about. If he had succeeded in wiping her out, he could have picked up the Keyblade and used its magics with the genie magic in the Abomination to fuse his body with the Abomination, therefore becoming part of it, which was essentially Charming's whole goal. He wanted to create a vessel that was so strong it could penetrate through the magics and physical barriers of the realm that they lived in to join the gods, to join as the 13th, but also as to join his father, who was Tomias, the god of royalty. This did not happen, however, as you know. Charming died, and the party escalated up into the very top tier of the tower. They fought the abomination with Emery and Noah. Noah almost died. Kind of thought it would be poetic if he died, but he didn't, because the dice decreed that he caught himself, but whatever. I give this piece of advice for future DMs of any sort of campaign. Follow the dice. Even if you don't like it, sometimes the random spontaneous actions of the dice are the best little twists of the game, including the time travel from episode 15, including the abomination, including so many things. So here we are, at the end, episode 28, I would say. I title this one, extra content, or the final secret. I told the party past halfway point that there were six or so alternate endings to the campaign. I'm going to go through the main ones, not every single possibility. These kind of depended on the choice that they made after Red Riding Hood's dungeon, which was to either go after Charming or go after Soren, because whichever one they went after first, the other would end up being the main villain. If they had ended up going for Charming, they would have destroyed him easier and the Abomination easier because it would have acclimated less power. However, Soren by this point would have become desperate. He would have been in that castle without blood 
and I would argue maybe have wooed one of the servants in the castle to pop the bubble, release him, and Soren would have become essentially a monster. He would have corrupted the Kingdom of Glass, possibly killed Cinderella and Philip, or whoever his name, whoever his name is, and he would have taken over the kingdom in his own way. The party would have had to fight through the kingdom to get to him, which means hordes of vampires, which, if the party remembers, they were strong. And I also scaled them depending on the levels of the party, meaning I was ready to give them level 13 to 15 vampire fights, which they actually never ended up fighting. Another alternate. When the party discovered that there were three options to save Soren Markov in the college, which was to either go to Chernobog, to go to Pinocchio, or to give up. If the party had given up, they had two choices then. One, to fight Soren and to kill him. If they had chosen this, there would have been no saving him, no alternative. They would have had to fight the, the bubble, uh, sorry, they would have had to have popped the bubble, gone in, and fought him. He would have been blood crazed, and he would not have been able to be stopped except for a blade through the heart or having his HP read zero. If they had chosen to leave, that is the one and only way that I could have seen that they could have abandoned the Kingdom of Glass and actually had both possible bosses be as strong as each other. Meaning to say, if they had left the college and been like, well, guess we'll just leave them in the bubble, who cares? They would have left and probably gone to Charming. But after they left for Charming, Soren would have been left to his own devices, maybe wooed that servant, broken out, and enslaved the Dominion of Glass. After they finished Charming, they could have gone back and fought him too. But I'm meaning to say is that there was a possibility of having one major boss or two major bosses. The other alternates include the possibilities of what would have happened if the party had failed in either way. If the party had gone along the track that they had, which was to say, cure Soren and then go after Charming, and they had failed, if they had died at the hand of Charming, if they had died at the hand of the Abomination, the world that they knew it would have been enslaved by his power. The Abomination would have gone onto a rampage, destroyed the remaining kingdoms, and declared itself the king of the new realm. If Charming had survived, he would have fused himself using a keyblade with the Abomination and done the very same thing. The party would have failed, Aladdin would have died, Simba's army would be gone, and nothing could stand up to him. However, this sounds like a fantastic possibility for a sequel. Hmm. Well, too little, too late, they're dead now. The last alternate that I will discuss. If Soren Markov had been the main villain, Charming destroyed, the Abomination destroyed, and Soren had destroyed the party. The remainder, the remaining populace of the, uh, of the remaining kingdoms would have been corrupted into vampires. The wonderful thing, though, quote unquote wonderful, is that vampires themselves do not have blood that they find satisfactory. They actually find, are quite repulsed by what is inside of their own veins. Therefore, when they actually had run out of prey, run out of mortals, elves, dwarves, humans, whatever you want to say, and everyone was a vampire... What was there left to eat? The actual ending would have been that Soren would be king of none, because Soren himself cannot die naturally. As long as he was a vampire, he would have stayed in that bubble forever. So, if vampires corrupted the entire land and had nothing else to drink, the rest of his race would have died off without blood, and he would have gone on alone forever. You guys, thank you so, 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 so much for listening to this, as well as the 27 episodes of this campaign. I do hope you enjoyed them. Party members, if you are listening to this, hey, guest stars, if you're listening to this, thank you so much for your help. And people who are just listening to this for the fun, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you listen to our next campaign, Diablo 2, DM'd by our beautiful Jeff. And I hope 